I'm going to ask for our Connect team to go ahead and pass some Bibles down the aisle. If you don't own a Bible, just lift up a hand. Or if you don't have a Bible here with you this morning, just lift up a hand. We'd love you to take this home with you as a gift. There's nothing greater than you can do than to open up the Word of God. But we're going to be eventually landing in the book of Exodus. So go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verse 1 through 15. This is part 1 <laughs> of a four-part series, as I've shared with you. Part one being God reveals, part two, God initiates, part three, God redeems, and then part four, God proclaims. And let me give you just kind of a real quick picture journey of our journey through God reveals in this first quarter, okay? This is gonna take us all the way up to Easter. I've got it behind me on the screen. First of all, this morning we're gonna look at He reveals through His words. Next, he reveals through creation. Next, he reveals through the word for two weeks. Next, he reveals through the commandments. The next week, he reveals through judgment. And then we're going to take a three-week journey on the truth that he reveals through Jesus. Why three weeks on Jesus? Because Jesus is a big deal. Week nine, uh, he reveals through Jesus. Week ten, he reveals through our trust. Now, because of Jesus, it's... The church and how has God revealed himself through the church? Our trust. The next week he reveals through our submission. The next week he reveals through our understanding. And then the next week he reveals through our unity. That's going to be our journey all the way to Easter. I can't wait to walk through this with you. Week one. Let's talk about the truth that he reveals through himself. You'll realize how incredible it is that you and I have the privilege and the blessing of experiencing God. We get real casual with God. Jesus is our homeboy. We do religious activities, so we get really bored with some of our routines. Our prayers over dinner sometimes become nothing but just some sort of comic relief. Our whole approach to God is pretty ridiculous for the most part. This is God. <laughs> I'm right now hanging out in post-Christmas daddy world, right? Me and my wife, and, and we spoiled our kids rotten. It was awful. And then we took our kids up to grandparents, and they spoiled them rotten, right? And we went up, and my papa and my kiki, okay, which is my wife's parents, all right? We call them papa and kiki. Um, they got my kids some toys, and I almost had to rent a U-Haul truck just to come back from South Carolina with these toys. But two specific toys that kind of stick out that my kids love. My twin boys that are two, Mac and Burke, literally got a roller coaster. A real-sized roller coaster that now takes up my entire hallway. It goes up and down, and it wakes me up in the morning at about 5 o'clock in the morning, right? So a roller coaster, I mean, it's really awesome. I've even tried it once, almost broke it, but like, it's awesome, like, it's a roller coaster. And then my other son, Bolt, he got this Hot Wheels type of thing that you put up on the wall so that the brothers can't get to it, right? And he could play with this thing. Well, it's amazing how in that blessing, in those gifts that I've given to my kids, they become to, they, they start to get to this place where they're a little bit selfish. Does that happen with any of you parents? Like all of a sudden, very quickly, I mean, they didn't have this thing. But now because they have this thing, they got some rights. And they're going to tell everyone what they can do with their toy because that's theirs. And now I'm in this part where I'm kind of having to detox my kids and help them understand. Listen here, gentlemen. You don't own squat. <laughs> Anything that you have in daddy's house is a gift. And you're lucky I let you play with that roller coaster. It's a blessing, right? In the same way, guys, we're about to talk all the way to Easter about the truth that God has revealed himself to us. So this is what I want you to do, because you are some smart people. And I know you've studied the Bible before, and I know you've got your favorite pastors, and mama's told you something, and you grew up in this tradition. 
Don't come into this section telling God who God is. Don't start getting all casual with your deep theological words, seminary students that hang out with us. As if somehow you've got a corner on God's market, you're God's gift to explain God to the world. What we're going to do in this section is we're going to let God reveal himself to us. And we're going to let God speak to us. And I promise you, because of that, we ain't going to be strutting. We'll be bowing, grateful, and we will be worshiping this living God who has blessed us by revealing himself to us. Listen to this out of the Gospel Project resource. God doesn't own mankind anything. God is not accountable to us. We are accountable to him. But he has chosen in his love and mercy to reveal himself to us in many ways. God, out of grace, entered the world of darkness that disobeyed him and ultimately offered us salvation in Jesus God created us out of mercy. He has spoken to us out of mercy. He became one of us out of mercy. He calls us to himself out of mercy. Thank you, God, for allowing us the blessing of seeing you, of experiencing you. I pray if maybe some of you are here this morning, you're like, I don't know if I've experienced God. Maybe it's because you haven't given your life to God. You haven't begun a relationship with God. See, we believe that it's not just enough for you to show up at a church. It's not just enough for you to be born into a denomination or a religion. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And each and every one of you have to make the decision to repent of your sins and give your life to Jesus. It's a blessing. That he reveals himself to us. Well, there's two ways that God reveals himself to us. It's on the notes behind me. The first way is this. And it's brought out in the Gospel Project resource that you guys are going to unpack this week together. First way is general revelation. God reveals himself to us through general revelation. This is God coming to all people everywhere. This is like creation. Creation is found in Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 3. I'm not going to walk through this a lot because next week, guess what our title is? He reveals through creation. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this. But in Genesis 1, verse 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning, God. Not you, God. Not America, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Everything in this world that's been created by God reveals a maker, a creator, God Jehovah, the Alpha, the Omega. The second way that God reveals himself to us is through special revelation. Special revelation is defined in this way. This is God revealing himself and making himself available to specific people at specific times in specific places. How many of you guys would just say, and this is all right for you to raise your hand right now. How many of you guys would say that Jesus has revealed himself to you? Awesome. Jesus is alive. God is alive. The Holy Spirit is alive. And He is speaking to us in specific ways, specific times, specific places. The overarching place that we go to to find special revelation is the Word of God. Now, once again, I'm not going to unpack a whole lot about this this week because week three and four is He reveals through the Word. So we're going to talk about the importance of the Word of God for two weeks. But let me just remind you that in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, All scripture is breathed out by God. So we learn about God through scripture. And one of the cool things about scripture is that 
in Scripture, not only when we study Scripture, we get to experience God, but we get to read stories of special revelation. We get to read examples of how God came down from heaven to reveal himself to you and I, to people, to the legends of the faith. One legend of the faith that I just want to pull out for week one. I know you're like, man, we're week one, journeying through the Bible. Why are you in Exodus? We're going to get a lot of Genesis, I promise. We're in Exodus. So look with me in the book of Exodus. I want to look at the importance of God's words in special revelation. And I want to give you four things here this morning and some sub points. I want to give you four things here this morning that help us understand his words. Help us understand who he is as he reveals himself to us. Point number one is found in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Let's read this together. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now I don't have time to unpack the context. I hope you have a basic understanding of what's going on here. We're going to walk through all of it. But here's a man of God about to experience God. And his people, the Israelites, are oppressed. They've been in slavery. It appears to mankind, it appears to the Israelites that they've been forgotten. That they've been cursed, that they have been damned. There's such beautiful redemption. There's such beautiful mercy in God's word. Check out the mercy of God here. For the Israelite people, the nation of Israel by which Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Let's look at this together. In verse 2, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look at God. So let's look at his words. The first thing that I want you to know about his words is God reveals himself through himself in scripture and to us is this. Number one, his words arrive. His words arrive. We've just reminded ourselves, this is awesome. Like, don't take this for granted. I shared with you in my prayer, there are literally... People in this world who don't even have the Bible. They're full people groups, nations in this world who've never even experienced the Word of God. And here, God reveals Himself and He arrives. His words arrive. Well, look at all the different, unique, incredible things about the ways in which His words arrive. Number one, his words arrive in unique ways. In unique ways. A burning bush. <laughs> I mean, this is awesome, right? I'm not just kind of giving a category of a drug here, right? Like, like, this is real deal. Moses gets to experience God through a burning bush. I guarantee if I took a microphone and I went to every single one of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, I guarantee we would hear every single one of you share a different, unique story of coming to faith in Jesus. Does that boggle your mind? We think our God lacks creativity. Right? God has expressed himself to us in so many different, unique ways. For some of us, as I look out, I see you. I know it happened in your car. It happened at a worship gathering. It happened with a friend. It happened at a hospital. 
But God revealed himself in a unique way to you. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. His words arrive to us in unique ways. Don't get boxed in to think that God will only save your friend who needs Jesus right here during our invitation time. I want God to. I believe he can. I gave my life to Jesus during an invitation time. God came down from heaven and saved me at age seven at the East Edgewater Baptist Church here in New Orleans East when I grew up here in New Orleans. But he doesn't have to. And reveal himself in so many unique ways. How about this? Number two, in supernatural ways. Did y'all get this? There is a burning bush that's not necessarily being burned. See, when God reveals himself to us, it blows our logic. It blows our mind. All right, this isn't just like the Amish people who make those fireplaces, you know, and they have those, you know, fake fireplaces that, you know, burn. All. That's, that's not real deal stuff. This is an Amish thing that's going on right now. This is really God showing himself through a burning bush that's not being consumed. Supernatural. Sometimes, guys, when God reveals himself to us, our response isn't to try and figure it out according to this world. Our response is to submit to it and bow. Supernatural ways. He's not going to reveal himself in our ways. He wouldn't be God. He's above us. How about this? He reveals himself in humbling ways. You see the description. God says this is holy ground. Take off your sandals. Moses was afraid to look. When you truly experience God, as we've talked about, when his words arrive, when his presence arrives in your life, you don't walk away strutting. You walk away humbled by the very essence of God. Lastly, his words arrive in enlightening ways. I love this. When you look at the end, God starts to reveal himself. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God doesn't just come down from heaven and humble us for humble's sake. Not just say, oh, look, everybody bowing and stuff, and I'm just going to leave them in mystery. No, he actually, guess what? He enlightens us. He, he shares with us who he is. All right, number two. It's found in verse 7 through 10. Let's look at this. Continuing on the story, it says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because they're taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Verse 9, And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Not only, guys, do his words arrive. Number two, his words alleviate. There's a common denominator in this room. You ready for it? We're sinners. We share this all the time. If you're perfect, you're going to hate this church. And hate it. This is a place where we don't just accept sin. We're at war against sin. Because sin is counter to God. But we know that every single person in this world has fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And because of that sin, listen to me, this entire world, we're going to talk about the fall. I'm not going to talk about the fall right now. Since Adam and Eve sinned, this entire world has been in pain, in struggle, and in suffering. As you guys think back to 2012, anyone gone through a hard time in 2012? I'd like to see a hand. Anybody? It's because of sin. It's because of the imperfection that we have in this world. 
Well, because of that, listen to me. When God's words arrive, one thing that all of man needs is comfort. Guys, his words alleviate. There's some incredible things in this section about how God's words alleviate. The first is this. There is a recognition of the past. In verse 7, God says, I've surely seen the affliction of my people. And there's a recognition to Moses. I haven't been gone. I've always been around. I'm here for you. And I've seen the affliction of the nation of Israel. There's a real bond that happens. And I'm not trying to knock anybody that's tried to love on anybody. But you know, if you've gone through a real difficult time, if you've gone through a real difficult struggle... Like, it's not that you're trying to be mean or anything, but when someone comes to you that hasn't also experienced that struggle, it's really tough, isn't it? Especially if they start telling you what to do about things and start giving you more answers and stuff. But if you connect with someone who's gone through the exact same struggle, there's an immediate bond, there's a love, there's a, it's a recognition of the past. What God does when his words arrive is he gives us comfort and he recognizes our past. That's why God is so amazing. Why? Because Jesus came and he dwelt among us and he suffered like us. When you struggle and the words arrive, Jesus recognizes your past. But here's also, this is really good. There is presence for the present. What does God say in verse 8? He says, And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Sometimes, guys, when you're loving someone who's down and out, shut it! Just shut it! My wife, when she's struggling, okay, last night as she was struggling and not feeling so good, she didn't want me to walk in. Now, honey, open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, and verse, you know, and give her a five-point sermon. Like, she's going to knock the snot out of me. She just wants me to be there and hug her and love her and listen to her, right? Didn't take some notes? <laughs> For real. I'm trying to save you from getting slapped. <laughs> Presence in the present. When God's words <clears throat> arrive, listen, sometimes that's all we need. When I was sitting right there just praying with you, <clears throat> that was it. His presence was present. But this is also what's so awesome about God. When his words alleviate, there's hope for the future. He proclaims to the Israelites what? You guys are screwed. No hope. No. With God, there's always hope because nothing in this world is greater than God. God offers his hope. All right, his words arrive, his words alleviate. You are loving this alliteration. Here we go, verse 11 through 12. Point number three says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Israel? I mean, of Israel, out of Egypt. In verse 12 he says, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. His words arrive. His words alleviate. His words, number three, authorize. His words authorize. Some of you guys are tripping out over what God has called you to do in 2013. You're, you're freaking out. You know God's telling you to start this, to take a leap of faith in a relationship, go to the next level, to move. God's calling you some amazing things. You're sitting here and you're like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm a stutterer like Moses was a stutterer. Like I don't have the gifts, I don't have the ability. And I want you to know that his words authorize. If God has told you to do something, do it. Do it. His words authorize two things. Number one, man's work. Number two, God's work. His words authorize man's work. 
As we were at our lakefront campus last night praying with a core team, about 30, 40 people, and we're praying about this new launch. I remember Pastor Jim when we were here in our Metairie campus, and we were just, you know, hanging out together, small group. We're just praying about the future together. We believed with all our heart God had called us to start a new work here in Metairie. And because of that, we don't walk around Metairie just saying, hey, maybe would you, could you possibly do the whole Jesus thing? No, in the name of Jesus, he has given us authority to proclaim Jesus. And as we talked last night on our Lakefront campus, we're not out there according to our work. God has called us, and he authorizes our work. But also, he authorizes his work. We know that in the Great Commission, right? Jesus said, all what? Authority has been given to me. Because I came, I lived, I died, and I conquered death. What does he do in that authority? It comes back to man's work. This is the beauty. This is the balance we talked about in our online gathering. The balance between man's work and God's work. We always struggle with that. But I want you to know that God's work is giving us permission to participate with him in his work. Authorize. Lastly. It's found in verse 13 through 15 as we close out this amazing text. It says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel, dude's tripping out. And he started talking about his stuttering issues and all that other kind of stuff. He's tripping out. But God just said, I'm going to be with you. And he says, If I come to the people of Israel, God, what am I going to say to them? The God of your fathers. And then, and then basically this is what happened. The God of your fathers sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And here's God's response. This is so amazing. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That wouldn't necessarily help me. <laughs> but God said, tell them, I am who I am. And he said, say this people... O oh, Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to this people of Israel. Now this helps me a little more. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Guys, his words arrive, his words alleviate, his words authorize, and get this in, in point number four. His words are. So, tell me about God, and tell me about all that His words are. Well, well tell me, like, about His words, and this, and could they possibly be? His words are. God said, I am who I am. Nothing overtakes me. I am the author I am the creator, I am the beginning, I am the end. And as God explains this, he names all things past, present, and future. And he says that his words are, check this, in verse 13, God was. Verse 13, he says, and if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. They ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? It says, and if I come to people, he's talking about the past here. God was. Check out number two. God is in verse 15. God stamps his sign on all of humanity. And he says, listen, tell them I am who I am. And then thirdly, God will always be. Check out verse 15. It says, say to this people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name now in the past, but this is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And guys, like what I want you to know about this God, when he reveals to us, his words are. <clears throat> Don't waste your life. 
Don't waste your life buying the lies of the world that tell you this world is. This world is not. He is. His words are. That passage that we read in our last United in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever reigns true right now. And I just believe with all my heart as we launch into this incredible new year, I believe with all my heart that for some of you, the launching pad of 2013 is you surrendering your life for the first time to this Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is revealing his words to you. His words are arriving right now. They are alleviating right now. They are giving you authority right now. And his words are here right now. Will you give your life to Jesus? I'm going to ask for our band to come on up. We're going to close out our time. But I just I want every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed. Every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed. I want you to jump into this new year. Being equipped by his words. I don't know what that means for you. I pray for some, it's salvation. Jesus has come down from heaven he offers you salvation. Will you give your life to Jesus? For some of you, it's a challenge to keep going, to keep fighting the good fight. Your time on this earth is not over, and you've, in your life, repented of your sin and trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And, and maybe for whatever reason, you've gotten too casual with God or... You've allowed sin to distract you. And, and even as you look into 2013, the, the dreams that you're thinking about, the, you're praying over all the different things, they're not focused on the Lord. So I pray that His words have arrived to you this morning. I pray that His words have given you incredible comfort. His words alleviate those anxieties you have for the new year, the struggles, all the different things that are going on. There's a recognition of the past, presence in the present, hope for the future. But also for some of you, those things, you're, you're not fully confident right now, but God's called you to something. I want you to know, take hold of the truth that if God has called you to something, His words authorize they empower you to do great things in His name this year. So grab a hold of that. And then also just be comforted in all things that His words are. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. And then we're going to sing a song in response. If we can do anything for you, please fill out our vintage notes or come and talk with one of our pastors or leaders. We'd love to journey with you. We'd love to talk with you about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the blessing that we have of experiencing you. And Jesus, we bow in your presence thanking you for revealing yourself to us today. For some in this room, this is salvation. For some in this room, this is confirmation. For some in this room, this is your comfort, your healing. For some in this room, this is a challenge. Lord, 
I pray that for all of us in this room, this is you revealing yourself to us. And this is us worshiping you. So Jesus, lead us as we sing this last song, dedicating and giving all things to you. For you are worthy of all worship and praise. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.